Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so next we have Dr. Alison Halford um, talking about unlocking the potential of census for the benefit of the environment, people, places, and ethnic. Brilliant. Thank you, Alison. Um, thank you. So before I start, I want to manage our expectations about this presentation because I notice you're really solution driven. And this project was not, it was very much about resolutions because we didn't want to end up with the wheat size up. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to draw upon my own biography. My sister is very similar size to me. She just turned 50 in September last year. And she said to her husband, I really hate being this way. I want to lose weight and I'm going to eat more fiber. And her husband's an engineer and he said, don't worry, Jan, by Christmas, I'll have the solution. And during those three months, he kept saying, don't worry, I know exactly this is really what you need. Christmas day, she comes down to the sitting room and for Christmas, he'd given her an exercise bike that he'd converted to grind wheat. Um, and in trying to solve a problem, he created a whole new set of problems because she didn't speak to him until the new year. <laughs> <laughs> but that is what often we find that when we are focused on a solution, we miss the dialogue, the context, the alternative narratives around that, that discussion. So what did we do at this writing retreat? Okay, I'm... There's a, there's a, yeah, that's it. Am I going to click the... Yay! Um, okay. Oh, okay. Yes, this is it. We were ambitious. Now, most writing retreats, as you know, are quite passive. And they're also quite singular. It's about improving your writing. We went beyond that. We, we definitely were ambitious in our vision. We wanted to see what happens when we bring together people working in this space and see what, what they could produce in terms of a collective consciousness around the digital environment. Now, this is not without a, a, a prototype. We know that I was involved in tomorrow's engineering research challenges, so I had some insight to how it was delivered. But we just went that bit further. In, so, and our ambition now has expanded to beyond a briefing paper. We intend, therefore, to also produce a journal paper from our findings. What's going to do? So, who, who were the people? Who did we involve? Um, oops, I'm really good at this, aren't I? Okay, now I'm drawing attention to that, not to single them out, not in any way, this is not a wall of shame, but I'm just drawing attention to the fact that we were very selective about who we invited. Out of the 67 we invited, 24 agreed to come and 21 actually um, were able to attend the writing retreat. Now there's two things I want you to draw attention to. Firstly, that there's an appetite for it. To have over a third of respondents come, there is definitely an appetite for this kind of activity. Secondly, because we were, we before we extended an invitation, we actually read through papers that had been published by them. We looked at their biographies. We were very considered about who could attend, but there was a huge challenge. If it were not for the CDE expert network, it would have been looking like uh, in cupboards under the stairs. Digital, people working in the digital environment are hidden away in departments in very strange combinations. One would think you would go to a digital related uh, faculty, but you'll find they're in geography or sustainable development. I cannot emphasize how critical it is if we want more and more collaboration to have a central point where we can find those experts. Um, so how did we do it? Okay, now we had varied activities and we're all, it was all about disrupting the norm. It was about taking these people into uncomfortable spaces and a lot of it was about critical re reflexivity and that's different from reflection. Reflection is where you do it as an individual. Critical re reflexivity is a feminist method where we take the, uh, the discipline and we hold the discipline to account. So we really interrogate long-standing tropes and um, push back upon established thinking. Out of all those activities, what would we, and I'm always wary about the, the term success, what do we mean by success, but the activities, what were the ones where they engaged the most, that they found the most fertile, that they were able to feel the most connected, was none of these. The best, the feedback that I got was that the activities that worked the best 
was when they had meals together. It was those discussions. And I've reflected upon this when I was looking at the feedback columns. And I've come to the conclusion that in the act of breaking bread together, what we do is we move connections from transactions to more communal expressions. That we remove those hierarchies, those labels, and we around that dinner table have an opportunity to, to present ourselves beyond our work. Okay, so what insights did we gain from um, this writing retreat? At the moment, I'm still processing, we only finished last week, so I'm still processing the, the data. And there's an awful lot. So I'm going to add a caveat. I'm not talking about themes. We are doing thematically analysis. I should also just reference uh, the theoretical framework for the briefing paper is around data feminism um, so that we can really push back ar around racism, data cl uh, colonialism, and they're all isms, <laughs> and uh, heteropatriarchy. So that is so there is that transparency and in of itself, I don't have time to discuss that, but that was a journey itself, getting uh, people working in this space to think about theoretical frameworks. So the first insight can offer this idea of trusted authority. If you look at the image, what you'll see is a barometer. And one of the reasons is a part of our photo dissertation exercise was someone said this represented to her unlocking the benefits of sensors for the environment because it was trusted. That it didn't matter how much there was new technology, this is where she went to. And the notion that we become a trusted authority, I think, really is uh, relevant as we've seen more and more distrust occurs. Uh, Ulrich Beck says that as science replaces religion, science falls in the same trap as religion, that it offers certainty when in of itself it should embrace the uncertainty. In the bold, you will see something that we I saw within all five groups. Now we did have five, what we did, we divided people into five creative teams so that they had an opportunity to work in smaller groups. And this was a value that they really all commented upon. What happens invariably is we're very reductionist about sustainable development goals. We're quite, you know, we'll just say we reference them in a very kind of generic way. And what becomes really apparent, if you want to inform policy, you have to be explicit about how that work fits into that goal. Not the, the tagline goal, but the categories. There are categories within the categories. The second insight, and this particular image, again, one of the participants used it to, to show how the, the barriers we have can limit, you know, and stop us from reaching the beauty of the work we do. Now, to put simply the, 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 the point where everyone converged, this idea of democratizing knowledge, I think I can put in really simple terms. You are gatekeepers. You have the power and the ability and the capability to allow others to understand your work. But once you are dazzled by the technology, once you start talking in terms that alienate those around you who are outside of your sector, you will not get your story across. And not only that, you reinforce exclusive, the exclusivity, the knowledge hierarchies, the very um, antithesis of what you want to do. One of the privileges I have of, of, of having insights into your work is I see the tremendous amount of good you're doing, but at times I do not understand why you are doing it. And sometimes I don't know why I should care about what you're doing. And this was a really critical point. We need to be able to tell our stories so everyone can buy into our journey. The last and final point was about transformation. And this is probably the, the point so I'm just checking on time. I'm okay. Yeah. Um, it's about transformative community of practice. And the thing that became very apparent was there was a need for to work. They called it, I quite liked what they were talking about. They wanted this idea of coming together as an imagined community. And this comes from Benedict Anderson's idea that we don't have to have an actual community. We can have a virtual community, an imagined community. Now, I think this one is not without controversy. I, I 
think reading through people's comments what they envision is a very egalitarian very inclusive diverse space addressing some of the issues we know we have within um, your community about retention about attracting certain um those that traditionally excluded or marginalized um within this this discipline but i'm going to add a caveat here in asking for a central point invariably someone is going to have to lead it so even if you give the funding if you give funding to one institution we then start elevating one institution upon the other and i came into academia late and i didn't realize the scale i'm a coventry university and i have had experiences that make me realize that, that there is still i thought we had moved on from this there is still a lot of privilege associated to where you are located so this idea of the place and i think we need to think very carefully when we talk about centers is are we just reproducing privilege and we can only a few can only access or and we're still in actual fact perpetuating the very thing that we claim we wish to to avoid so in conclusion overarching aim was to bring to the fore people places and ethics so what did we do that? I think, yes, we started the conversations and conversations change conditions. But there was three unexpected outcomes from this. And this was driven by the groups themselves. And I think this is when I said, start, we didn't know where we were going to land. I think this is what has made the journey exciting. But one of the things was that they wanted to see a survey and they really wanted to understand the needs and aspirations of people working. There is a concern that we are not retaining talent, that we are having to rethink particularly in the neoliberalization of universities is that we need to think very carefully how do we ensure that people that are the brightest and the best and feel valued and have value that we respect and honor and dignify this profession the second thing is about ideas about theoretical frameworks that was something that for some groups they hadn't encountered before and the understanding was that you don't necessarily need a theoretical framework for the work you're doing but you do need to ask yourself i design census you may think why would that what how does that reinforce inequality and that's the whole question that should be your starting point it is not about the technology it is about what the technology does in the everyday lives of people and lastly, this conceptualization of digital environment playgrounds, there was an appetite to have more fun. This is a serious endeavor and the opportunity to come together as a collective to in a supportive, safe environment to explore new ideas, to have opportunities to incubate, to think, to reflect, was seen something that could really help maintain not just the well-being of the individuals concerned, but actually amplify and advocate for digital environment, those working with digital environment having a bigger platform. I think in, um, to, in conclusion, I'd just like to say, the only, I believe the future in this profession is to ensure that you are informing and influencing beyond the academia. And that means you have to start to buy a different set of skills. Journal papers are not sufficient. They are not going to give you the impact you need. And so I would challenge you to start thinking about how can we disseminate in different ways so that we can encourage people to think differently, to attract people who are in different career directories, so that we can continue to sustain and maintain a healthy, um, vibrant and connected um, ecosystem. Thank you. Like ready for lunch. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I didn't anticipate any questions. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank I thought you. that that re that reflection on how difficult it would be to find people within the organisations. Yeah. Um, if this network teams is really is a challenge to us all to make sure that it's visible and that there are probably people who are still hidden. Yeah. 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 We need as part of this community. Um, I, I was interested in what you were talking about that that um, taking meals together and that being a really important yeah time. Do you think that means that the there's a need to bring some of that into the activities, or do you think the fact that it's just a different thing to the activities yeah. is actually part of the 
why it works. Um, I think, yeah, I think that that's a really good point. I think there's something very familiar about sitting around a table. So that if you are, uh, and also something quite secure, that's me telling you. <laughs> um, she says, so yeah, I think there is that familiarity, but also I think it's it breaks the space. It becomes an egalitarian space. A meal table, a table where you sit around, isn't in a classroom, it isn't in a presentation space. It is in a very neutral space. So I think space matters where we discuss it. I think the other thing is there is an expectation that you will talk. You know, a meal table, there is a certain amount of expectation that they will be, it's a communal, convivial event. But I don't think that's the only, only space. You're right. I think sometimes it's giving people something they can do and also allow them to step out sometimes because sometimes you don't want to talk. So it's about doing that space. So, yeah. So, yeah, I'm not advocating that you just turn a conference and just have four hour lunch hours <laughs> unless you go to Spain or, you know. <laughs> It's more traditional, yeah. The culture, the culture, yeah. Uh, and Steve's asking, what form might a digital environment playground take? Right, yeah, no. So I was looking at so this is they're exploring it. Then what they envisioned was it would all again it would be that inclusion that universities would open up their labs or space and host in some way an event that was that again would just be select invited rather than an open call and allow people interest it did people who don't normally work in that space to come together and so i so the vision that this particular group had but other groups have similar visions was about ensuring that they had didn't come with an aim to produce anything but to explore ideas but that perhaps they haven't got the time to or the intellectual space to do so i think that would be and it's again it also allowed um, those that have less access universities that perhaps so i look they, we can't go to a building like this and not be taken in by you know the sheer scale and you know access to resources yeah. they have and i think it behoves us as a community to open that up to all and so that's that's i sound like a political speaker don't i yeah <laughs> that's how i feel <laughs> right I think that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for the speakers?